Today I'm going to show you how to remove a scratch from a panel, uh, a scratch or an imperfection, something that needs to be uh, repainted, um, refinished, and people call it paint adjustments, whatever you want to call it. It's going to need to be repainted. So what we had here is two deep scratches that went all the way to down bare, all the way down to the bare metal. What I have always used is uh, I use my fingernail and if it was, if you can feel that scratch with your fingernail, you're going to probably have to refinish. And what you do is you take your fingernail and you just rub it over the top of it. And if you're, if it skips, it's deep. So you can feel it. And uh, if, you, if you can't feel it, well, you might have a chance of salvaging it. Um, with polishing it out or um, some other means and we can get into that a little later but this these were deep these these had to come out what I am going to use is wet and dry sandpaper and what that means is this sandpaper is designed to be used wet or dry this is Rhino brand um, 400 grit it tells you right on the back of there what the grit is uh, and this is 400 grit that's what I use for things like this use a quality wet and dry sandpaper don't use Harbor Freight kind of stuff it's just it just it's just better to spend the extra money and what we're gonna do is we're gonna put a sanding block in the middle you don't want to use your fingers on something like this if you can avoid it. Just get in the habit of using the sand and block. This has already been done. It doesn't need to be done anymore, but for the sake of this video, we're going to redo it. This is, sandpaper has been soaking in a bucket of water. Let it soak for 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and the water, what it does, it, it acts as a lubricant. Uh, and it also, if you load your paper up, and which means the whatever it is you're sanding in fills the paper up so it's not sanding anymore or it's not sanding effectively you can take it in there rinse it off in the in the bucket and uh, then you got it's clean you just kind of rinse it out like you would a sponge so anyhow we've got our water which also acts as a lubricant like I said this doesn't need to be done because we've already we've already done it but you just take your in a circular motion like this, you know, I, or I suppose you could use a back and forth. I always use a circular motion. Anyhow, you get it down to, so the imperfection, whatever it is, see the residue on that? Okay, that's what we've just sanded. And then uh, you take it and we'll rinse that off in your bucket of water and see, it's like magic. This top is essentially ready to have this spotted in. When I say spotted in, we'll blow a little primer over the top of that. We'll let that primer set for a, uh, you know, several two or three days, and then we'll put some color on the top of it, and uh, we'll have the top done. Okay, we've got our primer mixed. We're ready to uh, put it in the gun. And but before I do that, I want to say something a little bit about this particular spray gun. This gun is specifically designed for primers, and it's specifically designed for the modern primers, the ones that use catalysts. And what that means is, is I use uh, three or four different guns that are dedicated to certain products. And the, this particular gun is designed and built for primers. And these are heavy body primers, that meaning that this stuff is, is typically thicker. It is thicker. It's quite a bit the viscosity, which means the thickness of the product is heavier than it would be paint and heavier than it would be like clear coat. This stuff would be like a thick chocolate milk if I had to, um, if I had to describe it. Where clear coat, for example, is like spraying water. So this stuff is quite a bit thicker. It needs a bigger needle. The needle and the cap, this is the cap here, there's a needle that goes in here 
and that needle is thicker, is wider, bigger around, the circumference is bigger, the cap is bigger, there's more air uh, that goes through the cap, the orifices are bigger. Uh, so this is designed for putting on heavier body primers. And what that means is uh, it's not going to spit, it's not going to load up on you and plug up on you and uh, do that kind of stuff that's going to make your life miserable. So that's why I use a dedicated gun for primer. Um, and then I also use a dedicated gun for my base coats. And I've got two different clear coat guns that I use. Uh, so, and that's all I use them for. This gun just is nothing but primer. My base coat guns are nothing but base coats, and my clear coat guns are nothing but clear coats. That's ineffective and expensive for the regular guy to do. Um, they make kits, there again, Eastwood makes a kit that has uh, uh, one gun, and it comes with two or three different caps and two or three different needles so that you can kind of um, use everything with one gun, and that's a great hobby way of doing things. I just like to do it this way because I don't do this stuff nearly as much as I used to, but when I did do this kind of stuff, it was just it just the right tool for the right job, and that's why we do it. So anyhow, what we're going to do now is we're going to uh, pour our primer into our gun, and like I've said before, I'm going to say it again, this stuff is designed, is intended for professional use. Use that uh, as you may, but that what that means is, is it's not designed for the regular kind of hobbyist. Uh, so, that being said, we're going to put our, our uh, primer in our gun. As a precaution, use a strainer. Pour the stuff into your cup by using the strainer. And what the strainer is going to do, it's going to trap all of that, that stuff that could or potentially plug up your gun and keep it in the strainer. So now we've got that done and we're ready to go. Can't express safety enough. Use your gloves, use a respirator. This stuff is uh, I haven't had isocyanates bad, and isocyanates are what's in the catalyst. So always make sure you've got a respirator. Always make sure that your cartridges are fresh because if your cartridges aren't fresh, the uh, you're good. It's just you're going to taste the stuff, you're going to smell the stuff. You'll know when your cartridges are bad. I always keep my cart. I always keep my mask in a zip-up plastic bag. Um, and I change my cartridges frequently. If I'm painting, if I've got stuff that I need to do uh, three or four or a week or whatever, and I'm going to use the mask during that entire time, I'm good. But anytime I let my, any time I haven't used something for, uh, you know, a month or, I always change my cartridges. It's just better to be safe than sorry. And like I said, you'll know because you'll taste this stuff. It'll, uh, the cartridges won't filter like they're supposed to anymore. They're charcoal activated and you'll taste the stuff or you'll smell the stuff, but you'll know it isn't right because otherwise, nothing. So make sure, and this is just a little itty bitty little job. There isn't going to be much. This isn't like putting clear down. Clear really will fog up a room. And uh, you've got to use anything that's catalyzed. Make sure you use a, a, uh, a respirator, not a dust mask. Use a respirator, something that's designed for painting, and be safe. So anyhow, with that, let's go to it. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to let that first coat just kind of flash off. And what that means is we're going to let it dry for five or ten minutes, and uh, then we're going to go over it again, and that spot will be a little bigger than this spot. And what we'll do is we'll just kind of make this thing bigger and wider, and uh, then we've got everything covered. And what we'll do after that is once this stuff is completely dry, 
We'll wet sand it again with some 400 grit sandpaper and we'll just make sure everything is feathered, leveled, uh, not that there's going to be, should be any issue anyway, but what that does is you cover a big area and your eye won't see it. Uh, if, there's, if there's a small imperfection, in a, like if we had just left it like it was, and chances are this wouldn't have give us, given us any problem. This paint's been on here for I don't know how many years. Been on here a long time. It's been all cured up. We could have probably gotten a buy, buy with it the way it was, but I don't like to take those chances. See, that's why we're doing what we're doing. I didn't think it was going to do that but it is. So what we're going to do is we'll just kind of build this area up and we'll probably end up we'll, at the drip rail. We'll end up for sure at the drip rail, you know, in here. We'll probably put on two more coats once this stuff loses its sheen because it's kind of shiny right now. When it dries, well, you'll know it's dry like the edges are drying now. They're becoming kind of a satin uh, type um, they don't have a sheen to them or a gloss to them. So what we're going to do is we'll let this stuff flash off and we'll go over it one more time for sure, maybe a second time, and then we'll let it set for three or four days. We'll go over the top of the whole thing again real, uh, uh, real gently and uh, make sure it's good and clean. And then we're ready for paint. Then we're ready to put our top coat on there and our clear coat and we will have an Inca silver top which was a stock color in 1957 and it will be the stock color here in 2020. Okay guys, we've set out what we intended to do. I'm happy with it. We're going to let this stuff flash off. We're going to let it uh, set for several two or three days and uh, or longer and we'll next step is is to uh, go ahead and kind of scuff this stuff up go ahead and put our top coat on there and put our clear coat on there and then we will have a completed top so until then thanks for the help we'll see you next time you got any questions uh, any comments, any suggestions, uh, if there's anything that we can do to try and make this more interesting, let us know because we'll, we want you guys to watch and uh, be a part of this build. Thank you.